Hello and welcome to a DM's Guide. On today's episode, we're going to change it up a little bit. We're not going to look at the Tomb of Annihilation, we're going to look at how to introduce a new character to an existing campaign. So what I do is I have five questions I ask. I get the player to introduce their character idea because if they give me a piece of paper and I simply read it, I might not interpret it correctly. So I get them to explain their own words what the character is, what their general idea is, what's his bonds, what's the character's flaws, and just how the character works. Also, if I've ever met this person before, talking with them face-to-face or perhaps over Skype, for instance, allows me to figure out if I would actually like to play with this person. And after I figure out if I actually want to play with the player in my game, if you're playing a bad game of Dungeons & Dragons, it's better off not playing any game at all. And I want to play with people I have fun with, and I want players at my table to enjoy my company as well. So once that's out of the way, the second question I ask is, why is their character in my game? If I'm running a one-shot or a campaign, ask them why their character's here and why they're involved. So let's say I'm running a one-shot where they have to rob a bank. If the characters already have lots of money, they wouldn't need to do that. So their character wouldn't be involved or immersed in the situation. Also, let's say that if the character is a pacifist, they don't want to play in a game that's just full of fighting. What I do, the players there try to figure out why would their character want to be in this game. And just so they can play, and it works both ways. So for instance, if their character has a very cool backstory, I can implement it into the game to make it more immersive. Once I figured out that... I figure out what the relationship to the world is. So the example I'm going to use is I'm going to use the region as Chult. So that's where the Tomb of Annihilation takes place. And Chult is this peninsula that's very dense rainforest. Did they live in this region? Did they travel here? Do they know this region? It's really important because the character might know things that the player doesn't know. Or for instance, if the player has played this campaign before, the player will know more information than the character. That's the reason why I asked this question. And I think this is really the main one. Why would their character work as a team? Because I've played a lot of games where everyone starts a game and there's no reason from the team up. If you've just met a character and you don't know if they're good, bad, evil, it takes a while to figure out why you would team up, why you work. Because you want to work with people that have mutual goals and they're not going to stab you in the back. And with Dungeons Dragons, your characters can kill each other. And it's good to have a mutual goal. It also prevents them from stealing from each other early on in the game, where things can get quite heated. And for my final question, I try to figure out how this character would interact with Plot Hook, which kind of works with this question, why are they here? So I'm going to use an example of the one shot I'm going to play. So they have to interact with the characters that are the princes of the land. Are they friends of the princes? Are they enemies of the princes? as in they can come from different angles and it allows players to interact with me and they can build their own story. It makes it more interesting for me as well. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take these five questions and I'm going to ask a new player who's about to join my game. So a couple of episodes ago, I did a competition for episode 10. I asked viewers to put their favourite experience of Dungeons and Dragons into the description. And the player you're going to meet now, Ryan, is the one who won this competition. And he's now going to play in the new one shot I've written. With this one shot, once it's been play tested, I'm going to release it. And if you're a patron of mine, you'll get it for free. And you can also discuss where this channel goes, what campaign I discuss, or do more videos like this. Before I speak any further, enjoy the footage. You'll see me introduce a new player, and I'll use this method. I hope this helps. Who is your character, Ryan? My character is Ludo. He is a Minotaur Barbarian Fighter. Ooh, how many levels of each? He is level 8 Barbarian, level 4 Fighter. Why is he a fighter and why is he a Barbarian? His family were all Barbarians. Family were all taken and forced into gladiatorial arenas to fight. He grew up starting off as a Barbarian, fighting, trying to stay alive. And then it's while well fighting in the arenas that he learned how to be a fighter and trying to improve his skills to try and win his freedom. We have a background then. So he was in Gladiator Arena. He is a barbarian fighter. He's a minotaur, which is common because minotaurs have been used in gladiatorial combat for a long time. Why are they there then? So why is he in Chult? What we can do is we have a merchant prince called Inkan Afa, and she's a female Chult student human gladiator. She won numerous gladiatorial contests in Port Nazareth's arena before she invested her winnings into financing her first trade deals. So she's linked into the gladiatorial arena. It also, let's, let's put in context the one shot then. So the one shot is in Port Nazareth. And in Port Nazareth, we've got different merchant princes and they have a loose rule over the city. Do you know much about Port Nazareth, right? Only the basics. Okay. 
the one shot's going to take place about one month after the death curse has been cured. Because Port Nazareth now, people are living, people are not dying on the street. It's time to celebrate. The whole of Port Nazareth is going to have a massive party and it's going to be a week-long celebration. It's called the Festival of Life. During this week-long celebration, there's going to be a discussion with all the merchant princes to see who will take over Port Nazareth. One of the things in Port Nazareth is assassination is paid for. You can pay for assassins to kill anyone in the city. However, if you pay assassin to kill someone, they know the name. We basically have Jasmine is also another merchant princess. She has the monopoly of assassination and poison in the city. And there's always a risk that merchant princes might assassinate other merchant princes to get political power. So my idea for you joining this one shot is that we have Darina, which is in the earlier 20 here. Would you say that Ludo has a positive relationship with this merchant prince, or do you think they will be antagonising each other? Do you think he'd look up to her since she's the queen of the arena? Ludo's a bit simple. Mm-hmm. He used his horns and headbutt too many times that he's a bit rattled in the brain. I do think he would probably look up to her as a fighter. Like he respects everyone that fights and everyone that fights honourably. So as long as she's an honourable fighter, he would respect that. Well, I think that, so he's been in the Coliseum, so the description of the Grand Coliseum is the statues of the arena's greatest champions lying on the top of the Coliseum walls. So when he's fighting, he'll see a statue of her, and you, this is someone I can look up to, or do you think they might have a more personal relationship? Do you think she might have been his tutor? Yeah, yeah could, she, she could have been the person that is taught him to be a fighter to try and increase his chance of getting out. Mm -hmm. So let's look more, because I assume that your character knows his character quite well. So let's look more details into this Merchant Princess. So we have Ikafa is a lawful good, so she's a good character, a female children and human gladiator. She's won numerous gladiatorial contests in Port Nazareth's arena before she invested her winnings into financing her first trade deals. She's a legend among the common rabble who grew up watching her battles. Her husband, Kura, is a painter, and they have twin teenage sons named Rossin and Kurik. Rossin is a city guard, and Kurik is a popular dinosaur racer, and they're both named after Chalchian Rivers. Akin Afa sells non-magical weapons and shields of every kind, and she also pays Wantanga Otomatu to place permanent enchantments on a select few of these items, which she sells at prices listed in the magic shields and weapons table. So that's all the information we have on her. So Wantanga is a protagonist in the Tomb of Annihilation because he's the only merchant prince that's friends with Syndra, who's a woman who invites you to Port Nazareth. So my idea is you come back, you've been invited by Wantanga, which you've had a positive relationship with, and he's asked for simple service of, can you please watch me during these festivities? Just to make sure no one assassinates me during the festival. And because we have this character here, the female gladiator, she's in a good relationship with him. She might ask Ludo the same. So she might ask Ludo, hey Ludo, can you watch me for this week to make sure nobody assassinates me? Yeah. And then what I could think is, because these princes and princesses are friends, they might go to dinner together to make sure that nothing bad happens to them. Okay. Your character's looking after her. The other player characters could be looking after Matanga. Yeah, no, that sounds good. Because my premise with this is, as you've noticed in your campaign, Ryan, when you ran Port Nazareth, you don't really spend much time there. <laughs> no. You're there and out again. Cause yeah, in, shopping, dinosaur race, out. Yeah, and you find the guide on your way to uh, the forest. Yeah. Because there's lots of really cool characters here. Your characters have a week to walk around Port Nazareth, they can see different things, they can do dinosaur racing, and you can just experience the atmosphere of Port Nazareth and try to figure out, this is like us serving the death curse is a good thing, you can actually see the difference in the people. The way the one shot's going to work, Ryan, is there's events during the week. So for instance, if your characters don't want to look after the Merchant Prince, they don't have to. Yeah. But that meeting will happen regardless if they're there or not. Yeah. So they can choose to defend the, the princes or not. Right. As in, they can change events. If they don't take part in an event, it will happen without them. And what I've also done, depending on what they've done in the campaign, affects what happens in this one shot. So there's multiple scenarios. What you've done in the campaign massively affects what happens in this one shot. With this one shot, I've designed it in such a way that it allows you to use this to go to different campaigns. So let's say that... So, for instance, when you did your campaign, did you meet with the Red Wizards, for instance? No. Okay. Did you meet the Flaming Fist at all? No. Okay. Uh, they went to, they went past one of the camps and that's about it. Okay. So the Flaming Fist is a mercenary company that is based in Boulder's Gate. Yeah. And at this time of the one shot, 
Baldur's Gates had very strange news. So the Flaming Fest is currently leaving Port Nazaru and leaving okay. Chult. Right. Because they've got bigger fest to fry over there. Okay. Let's go through. Interesting characters. We have Ludo the Minotaur. So what can a Minotaur do then? So a Minotaur has strength score increased by two and your constitution is increased by one. Your size is average over six feet. I've made him slightly taller than six feet. He's about nine and a half. Yeah, so you have proficiency in one of the following skills, intimidation and persuasion. You can write common and minotaur. If you had to say what is Ludo's favourite skill, like if he had to fight something, what would he do mostly? He uses his warhammer or rush with his horns. So he gets straight into combat then. What type of fighter are you then? He's a great weapon fighter. Martial archetype. I gave him champion. Yeah, okay, so he's a champion. Well, that makes sense because he's a gladiatorial fighter. What's yeah. your archetype in Barbarian? He is Path of the Berserker. Ooh, fantastic. Yes, we have your character, so why are they there? They're fighting. So do you believe that your character was in the Colosseum his whole life, or do you think he just came here after being in the Colosseum prior? Do you think he's been raised in Chult? No, he's probably raised somewhere else and then sold to Chulty in person. Yeah, so he's been shipped to Chult for the fights. So how old is Ludo? Ludo is 50 years old. Oh, so he's quite old then. Yeah, they age the same rate as humans up until they're about, I think it's 18, 19 years old. But then after that, they've got a slowed rate so they can fight at their prime. They can live until about they're 150. He's basically in human terms, he's 25. So how long do you think he's been here? Like maybe like 10 years to 15 years? Or? I would have said he was captured like in, with his tribe when he was young. He's been in the, the pits ever since he was maybe 15. Where do you think he's been in the pits prior then? Do you think he's been in like Waterdeep, for instance? Yeah, he probably did fight in Waterdeep for maybe 5, 10 years, if that. Mm-hmm. So that would make him 25 and then he got shipped to Chult and he's been there for 25 years, yeah. which is kind of why he got his relationship with the merchant princess. We can make the assumption that in Waterdeep, you'd never be able to leave the Coliseum. You'd be there for yeah. life. And that she actually gave him the, this is his final call for freedom. If, she, if he can do the job as her bodyguard, he'll get freedom. Yes. Yes. He's, he's the only one left from his clan. They've all perished from the death curse. So he's the only minotaur of his family that are left. So you're saying that your, your family were resurrected then? Yes, they died. They weren't being able to be resurrected. That's quite a cool premise that you'd have a prize fighter and if he died in the pits, you'd just resurrect him. Yeah. And you do that over and over and over again. Yeah, that, that's, that's kind of way that I kind of thought that they would do it. If they had the power to resurrect, why not have your best fighter resurrect and then he can just fight for you again somewhere else. Yeah. So Ludo is the only Minotaur who never died in combat. Yes. That, that works out. His family potentially could have been in the arena when the death curse happened and died and they tried to resurrect them and it didn't work. Yeah. That means Ludo would be happy for the player characters because they fix the death curse. Yeah. So he would have a bond with them and that's why he would work as a team. Yeah. If he's in the arena and it's like a team match, he's very protective over the people that are good to him or he's protective of the weak. So if anyone needs protecting, he will do it. That's why he agreed to protect the merchant prince. So if any of the team, he kind of creates a bond with that'll just I want to protect this person this person's good I need to, they need to be fine I don't I don't want them getting hurt all that sort of stuff yeah since he's quite a big and bulky minotaur do you think if he's walking about so imagine you've got your merchant princess so can you imagine them walking down the street you've got a really busy metropolis full of uh, bazaars and you have this massive minotaur walking around with this princess covered in scars so if you're walking around do you think you'd have a cloak covering all his muscles he just walks around like that with, with his, his chains. Would you think that the Merchant Princess, do you think she'd be walking around with him in chains then just to make sure he doesn't run away? No, he would trust her by now that she wouldn't need to. Mm-hmm. He just has chains wrapped around his wrists and around his neck from either previous people that have tried to capture him that he's never taken off and his previous owners, and he just kind of keeps the chains there as a reminder. Big teddy bear, he's, he only fights when he needs to fight. Yeah. He gets called in the gladiatorial arena a chain breaker, because that's that's what he wants to do. He wants to break the chains of anybody that's been falsely imprisoned, or break the chains of the hold of all the tyrants. If Ludo was left in Port Nazaro for like a week of festivities, what would he do then? What would he do for pleasure? A little bit simple, so he'd want to just explore and see everything that he's never seen before and try and talk to people to make friends. 
Do you think yeah. he's quite a glutton? Do you think he enjoy food and alcohol? He's probably never had it, so probably not. He probably eats what he needs to eat to maintain his strength. Probably doesn't drink alcohol because he's never been given it. He would drink what he was given. So for instance, if he's walking around stalls and he sees big slabs of dinosaur meat, he can see mysterious cocktails of alcohol and food and water. Do you think he would try to fill himself or do you think he would be very restrained? He, he probably would only take what he needed to sustain himself. He probably wouldn't be very gluttonous. If he was in a rage, on the other hand, he probably would. He just eat what he wants. It depends what mood he's in. Because he's big and being brought up as a fighter and he's a barbarian, if people get him angry, then he'll just change his state from being a big level of teddy bear to an angry bear. Ryan, thank you very much for your time and introducing your character. I'm really excited for playing with you in the future. And for those watching, if you want us to live stream this one shot, let us know in the comments below. Meanwhile, stay tuned for the next episode of A DM's Guide to Tomb Annihilation, episode 13, where we discuss Unk's Tomb. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoy that as something different. If you want me to do something like this again, let me know. And I'll see you the next time. Ciao.